Cold boot attacks are back, British Airways got their website hacked, and the GCHQ data collection standards are deemed illegal. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morse, and this is ThreatWire for September 18, 2018. Your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. Our Patreon is at patreon.com slash threatwire, and that is always the best way to support the show and will help us reach our next goal. So if you want access to exclusives, check out the Patreon link in the show notes below. And special thanks to our newest Patreon supporters who decided to join this month. And now on to the news. Johnny Cash sent this story over via the Patreon Discord. A decade ago, way back in 2008, an attack called a cold boot attack was documented as being a viable physical attack vector. Now, a decade later, this type of attack is resurfacing as a newer version of cold boot attacks that can work against modern day computers, including laptops from leaning manufacturers. Now, F-Secure wrote about this on their blog last week, and two security researchers will be presenting their findings at the SECT conference in Sweden than at Microsoft's Blue Hat V18 later this month. Cold boot attacks, which have been demoed on early Hack 5 episodes, take advantage of the way that data is stored on the RAM. RAM remembers data even after reboots, and if attacked in a physical hack, data can be stolen. DRAM, in particular, refreshes memory faster at higher temperatures and slower at slow temperatures. So when the DRAM in a machine is cooled to negative 50 degrees Celsius, memory is kept for a longer period. An attacker could cool it to negative 50, and then the machine is powered off immediately while the RAM is cooled and the DRAM is swapped into a machine that can read it or the machine is booted into an attacker's operating system off a flash drive, then that data is copied over and stolen. The DRAM can be reinstalled in the machine and rebooted, which to a normal user would raise no red flags. Now, F-Secure researchers found that even though newer systems wipe memory during their boot process, which was an answer to the cold boot issue created by the Trusted Computing Group, futzing with the firmware can make the machine skip that process, so the old cold boot attacks will still work against them. Manufacturers updated operating systems to set a firmware value specifying whether or not a memory wipe should occur each time they are rebooted. Usually, the memory is wiped based on this value, but the operating system can override this by clearing the value as long as sensitive data has already been overwritten on the RAM. So the booting PC skips the wipe and the loop continues. So in theory, if the operating system is shut off without that clean wipe, then the firmware tells it to do so upon reboot. Thus, plugging the RAM into another machine or booting into an attacker operating system would still trigger that wipe. But if that memory overwrite request firmware value is overwritten, then the wipe is skipped and a cold boot attack can still occur. Now, some fixes have been announced. Microsoft's BitLocker configuration allows a user to require a BitLocker pin to start and disable system suspending, while Apple says that any machines with a T2 security chip are unaffected. Ars Technica does argue that memory should be wiped for all shutdown processes except for the suspension state, where most things are powered down but a quick boot is still optional. But what can companies do to keep their devices safe? Requiring BitLocker pin upon power up is super, super simple. Force laptops to shut down or hibernate instead of suspend. Keep laptops safe and report missing ones and create an incident response plan for missing devices. Now, of course, if you don't have BitLocker, you should keep your device in your possession. Cold boot attacks can only work at a physical layer. So if an attacker can't touch your device, then they can't run a cold boot attack against it. In a post by British Airways, which was last updated on September 13th, the airliner explained that customer data was stolen in a theft between August 21st through September 5th via their website and the mobile app. This included personal and financial details for anyone who booked or changed flights during that time, limited to the credit card name, number, expiration date, the CVV, and address details. Now, British Airways did state that if you made a change or you booked a flight with a credit or debit card during that time, that you should contact your bank provider for more information. In total, about 380,000 card payments were affected by the breach, and customers should be contacted by British Airways. Now, BA also continued on to warn of phishing attempts, which is normal with any hacks. Now, the interesting part is this hack only took 22 lines of code, according to the cybersecurity firm Risk IQ. The group involved is allegedly called Magecart, who also targeted Ticketmaster in June. They used digital credit card skimming techniques and customized the code to better 
surf at the British Airways website, so it was less likely to be spotted by a network administrator. They modified the code on the BA site that handles baggage claims, in which a customer fills in their name, address, email, and financial details. That page uses a JavaScript library API to send data to baways.com, which was actually a Lithuanian-hosted site that MageCard manages. The malicious code was added to that JavaScript library that BA uses to send the data to that malicious web server. It was signed with a Komodo TS certificate as well, which made it look legit. And this same hack also worked on the mobile app. Now, British Airways has had a headache of a year when it comes to technology. They had about 7,000 passenger tickets canceled due to an IT system failure, and a power outage took them offline in May 2017, and hundreds of flights got canceled. After finding the breach and fixing the issue and starting an investigation, the website functionality has resumed. Chosen by our Patreon patrons as a top story for this week, we've got violations of human rights! Yay! The European Court of Human Rights ruled last week against the GCHQ, which is the UK's intelligence agency, finding that their mass surveillance scheme violated the European Convention of Human Rights, which is the ECHR for short, by unlawfully intruding into citizens' lives and freedoms of expression. So they found that their sharing of intelligence information with other Five Eyes, like the NSA, does not actually violate the Human Rights Charter, but using loopholes and sharing to bypass past restrictions on surveillance of citizens would. Now they focused on three different topics. There's bulk interception of communications, intelligence sharing, and obtaining communication data from service providers. In the ruling, which is linked below, the judges ruled five votes to two that there was insufficient oversight of the selection of internet bearers for interception and filtering, search and selection of intercepted communications, and also the safeguards governing the selection of data for examination were inadequate. They also ruled in six votes to one that the regime for obtaining the communications data from communications service providers violated Article 8 and it was not in accordance with the law. They also ruled that the bulk interception regime and regime for obtaining communications data violated Article 10 of the convention because there were insufficient safeguards with respect to confidential journalistic material. Two more complaints were also made, but those were rejected, and all complaints were brought forward by several journalistic or civil liberties groups, including Big Brother Watch, Amnesty International, the ACLU, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, and Alice Ross, and several other human rights organizations. Now, the interesting part here is that the court did not find surveillance itself to be illegal. It found the way that the government collected the information to be illegal. Bulk interception violated one article while freedom of expression was violated due to its chilling effect on journalists. The court found no evidence that the government was abusing its power of authority in surveillance, but did caution that better safeguards and better independent oversight should be put in place to evaluate the type of data collected, whether that be internet traffic or personal data. Patrons, make sure to share your favorite stories in the community tab or on Discord, and every Friday I will pick three or more top stories for a voting poll that patrons can vote on to be included in next week's show. Patrons also get access to a downloadable audio version of the show, first looks at show topics, polls, discussions just for patrons, behind the scene photos, and now that Discord server just for patrons at $2 per month and up. Join now to get access to all of these and help support the show. Our next milestone goal gives you access to a live video Q&A just for patrons at all levels, and it gets us closer to doing a second episode each and every week. And also a big thanks to our Hush Puppy Perk Level patrons for sending in their adorable fur baby photos like all of these kittens. They're adorable. I love them. Keep them coming. Hit that subscribe button, share this episode on your favorite social media page as well, and hit that notification bell too, just in case our shows do not show up on your notifications and subscriptions. And with that, I am Shannon Morris, and I will see you next time on the internet.